Hey everybody, Casey Miratori here. This is part two of the in-depth look at the assembly language that was shown at the end of the University of Twente lecture. And in this part, I go through the actual assembly language code as it appeared in that lecture and show you how to look at what the instructions actually do and how to simulate them using a tool that will try to predict what the CPU is actually going to do. Now, again, uh, this is just to the best of our our knowledge. I'm not a hardware guy. I have no inside knowledge of what Intel chips actually do. So this is just what us software people do when we're trying to get some information as to why something's running too slow or you know how fast it should run, those sorts of things. Again, this is part of a series, so if you haven't watched the original University of Twente lecture or you didn't watch part one and you want to check those out, the links are in the description. And also, of course, this is part of our Kickstarter series, so the link to our Kickstarter is in the description as well. Please check it out. Uh, other than that, if you're all caught up, here is part two of the assembly language uh, instruction sort of walkthrough, and I hope you enjoy it. Hello and welcome back to our little run through of the code that was in the simple code uh, high performance presentation that I gave uh, to the University of Twente. And I went over in part one of this a sort of simplified model. I just kind of walked through it on the light board to try and give people just a broad understanding of sort of what's going on inside a modern CPU just at a conceptual level. And it was not a pipeline diagram or anything like that. We didn't go over actually all the stages. I don't even know all the stages that happen in Skylake. I couldn't draw it for you. Um, and so what we did at the end of that stream was we took a look at this diagram here, which was just Intel's sort of conceptual model that they provide uh, for Skylake. And I just kind of went through you know, roughly what's going on. Again, this is not a pipeline diagram. It doesn't really tell us how the chip works. It's just like sort of a logical flow, right? It's like, here's roughly what's on the chip and roughly the d direction and connection between various parts. And that's it. Uh, so if you don't have a at least vague understanding of what's going on in here, please watch the previous part because that's going to give you just a, a little more familiarity with what I'm talking about. Because we're going to refer to these stages, front end, back end, micro op, um, and things like that, uh, execution port. And so when I'm saying those things, I'm not going to take a lot of time to explain what they are, because I'm going to assume that you understood them from the previous part. Uh, and but that's so if I'm saying things like that and you missed the first part, that's where you go to get that information, because you kind of got to know that stuff as we go through here. So I'm going to leave this open, but we're just going to kind of assume you can remember that there's this flow going on where there's a front end, which turns sort of the, you know, instruction stream you created when you compiled your program or when you wrote it in assembly. And it comes in here to the CPU. It's turning it into micro ops. Those micro ops are going from the front end to the back end where they're getting scheduled onto various ports that can actually do work where they're doing the work implied by the micro op, and then the results of the micro op are either getting put back into like the register file to be used by future instructions, uh, future micro ops, or they're getting, you know, there are things that generate like loads and stores to memory that will then go out and talk to caches and that sort of thing, right? So we're just gonna be assuming that this is going on behind the scenes. Uh, so the original question that prompted this two-parter was can you go over the stuff that you showed in the previous presentation and explain kind of like how it's scheduled and that sort of stuff. So what I've done here is I've created a Godbolt of it. And if you've never seen Godbolt before, which a lot of people maybe haven't, uh, it's a really fantastic tool uh, made by a guy named Matt Godbolt, I believe. Um, it's a very good last name, very powerful. Uh, and basically what he did here was he made it so that you could go to websites, you could put simple code into one side of the, of you know, the, well, not even one side, you can make little panes, so into a window, uh, and it would basically call a server and ask the server to compile that code using any number of compilers that you can pick from a drop-down list. You can see that, like, they manage servers that have all kinds of um, different compilers on here that you can pick. Now, when it runs it through the compiler, 
It will then produce the uh, output, the assembly language output, and it will put it into another window for you to look at. And it will also do some nice syntax highlighting for you. So what you can see here is if I hover the mouse over the lines of C code that I'm touching, it will show me which lines the compiler believed it was generating from any one of these that I hold my mouse over. Now it's not always accurate because compilers don't always do perfect tracking. Um, but especially in code like this, that's very simple and where I have like effectively manually assembly language programmed it using intrinsics, there's not a lot of wiggle room for the compiler anyway. And so it does correspond pretty accurately. When you move your mouse over these things, the color coding or, you know, or use the color coding, it's pretty much going to show you what instructions in the output of the compilation uh, actually correspond to your lines of C code. And again, this is not only a great tool for people who are playing around to see what compilers do with things. So when you're working on optimizations, this is a great tool because you can look at more than one compiler at a time. For example, if I wanted to, you know, I could add another compiler in here. Uh, where do you do that? There we go. Compiler. Uh, and I can just pick something else, right? Um, and in this case, it's a little bit annoying. You can see the compilation failed. The reason for that is, of course, I don't have the f this architecture set and that sort of thing. Um, so I have to make sure that I have the switches turned on that tell it to use, you know, whatever it's going to use. Um, but you can see here, like, okay, uh, you know, it, it, it will allow me to look at the output of many compilers at the same time. Uh, which means that if I'm curious about how different compilers might approach the same problem, uh, this kind of helps me do it. Now, there isn't much difference between these two, really. There are some things here that are not particularly good that it's doing, um, but it doesn't matter. And point up being the actual instruction stream is pretty similar. Uh, you can see here that it's you know fairly straightforward how it's doing it. There's some things with memory operands that the... the that are a little bit odd, but you know, on the whole, right? Um, it looks pretty good. Now, I don't. It will it be smart enough if I do an O3 to get those out of there? No, weird. All right, sorry. This is the the weird like fixation brain focusing in on those things. I'll ignore that for now. We don't even need to talk about that. The point is, Godbolt is a great tool for this. Uh, it's very, very beginner friendly because you don't have to be programming in intrinsics or anything like that. You can just put regular simple C code in here, add a compiler, play with the switches, see what the assembly language comes out. And it's just really good for learning because one of the best ways to learn assembly language and how different things work is if you know a language like C already, you can just put that like what you want to know about, like how does it make a for loop? You can just write the for loop in C and then in Godbolt, it will just show you what the assembly language is for the for loop on the other side. And that's such a great way to learn because it's like a tr it's like Google Translate, right? It's like you can just put in the language you know and see it pop out the language you don't know. And by experimentation, you can learn a lot that way, right? So it really helps in terms of like learning the structure of a semi language and helps you see how see certain things, uh, constructs that you do understand translates into this language you don't understand, which helps you to build the understanding over time. And then, like I said, it's also a great tool for experts too, because it's just fast and easy to see the results in many compilers. And so it's just a really convenient way to look at what the compiler is doing with your code when it's not, you know, when it's not running fast enough and you're like, what the heck's going on? It's great to be able to go in here and see it across multiple compilers and tweak something and see it immediately change. So you can learn for the expert. Uh, the expert can go and learn what the heck the compiler is doing wrong when it's doing something wrong or how to adjust the code on the input to convince the compiler to start doing it right. You know what I mean? So, let's take a walk through the code. On the left side here, you can see the code that I showed uh, in the presentation. Although these intrinsics make the code harder to read, they are literally just the operation they say they are. So mm256 sub ps just means subtract these two things, right? And the result comes out here. 
So whenever you see an MM256 sub PS, you know that you're just subtracting eight floating point values from each other. Each one is stored in one of the registers, right? And, you know, that's all that's happening here. You can see they correspond directly to assembly instructions because you can see here that when I hover over this, the line that is that that I'm, you know, getting over here is V sub PS, which is the assembly language instruction for subtract. And you can see that these are the two registers uh, that are involved and one memory operand. Now, you may wonder what's up with these memory operands. Again, if you're unfamiliar with the assembly language, that may be confusing to you. The way that Intel assembly language works, the machine code that the processor reads, in general, you can take, sometimes you can take four, uh, depending on the circumstances, right? Uh, you can actually see that happening down here. Uh, but pretty much all the time, it there's, you know, two or three inputs to everything that you do, right? So you have an instruction like subtract. You have some number of inputs here. The first one that you give it is actually an output. So it is something you're telling it. You're giving it the name of a register, in this case, YMM8. You're giving it the name of a register, but that register is, is not necessarily going to be used. It may be used if the instruction uses the destination as well, and that happens sometimes. Uh, for example, this is an example of that. Here is a regular integer add. It's going to take this register, ESI, and it's going to add negative 1 to it. And you can see that it didn't say add ESI, ESI, negative 1. So when you are doing an operation that has the same source and destination, right, they are typically elided and just put as the first one. Now, that's not really a convenience feature. What that is, is actually the way the processor used to work entirely. Originally, there didn't really used to be instructions that took a destination. They always just took two sources, and the first source just got overwritten with the answer. So, like, you, the first parameter was always in out. It was always a source and destination. Um, but later, as they went, because it's inefficient in code streams to do that, uh, you end up with inefficient encodings of series of operations if you keep destroying your sources. You end up with lots of spurious copies because to copy something and then do it because it's going to destroy it, right, and so on. Um, they eventually added ternary and then quaternary, like, uh, you know, I don't know if you normally would call them that, but things that take three registers or three operands and things that take four operands got added. So when you look at V sub PS, what you see here is this is a pure destination. It will not read from YMM8. It will simply overwrite it. Uh, and then these two here are the actual things that are getting subtracted. The first one is a register. The second, it, second one is a memory operand. A memory operand is just when you're going to not bother moving something into a register first. It will just do the operation directly out of memory, right? Um, and when we say memory, we don't really mean it. What we mean is usually the L1 cache or the L2 cache or something, right? Always the L1 cache in a sense, depending on the circumstances. But So what we're usually doing here is we're just saying, look, get it out of the cache, but don't put it in a register because I'm never going to ask for it again, right? I'm just going to do an operation with it. So this is how this is encoded. And if you look at all of these things here, you can see, like I'm just doing subtracts, adds, multiplies, and they just come out as exactly the things that they are in here. So anything that's an add comes out as a, a V add PS. Anything that's a mul comes out as a V mul PS. And if you're curious about this syntax, the V is the extended, it's called a vex prefix. Um, and the V was an extension to the instruction set that added those ternary ops. So the things that take a destination and two sources instead of like a source dest and a source, those were all V instructions. And it's when they went to um, AVX, the, the AVX instruction set is what added those. So there's also versions of these instructions like sub PS without the V. And those are like the kind I said before, where they always took a source dest as the first parameter. So V instructions are the newer instructions. They're the ones that have AVX. And one of the things that's actually pretty interesting um, is that if I was using 
something uh, older here. If I wasn't using MM256s, if I was using MM SubPS, the, the smaller set, so not, not eight wide floating point, but four wide floating point, I could have gotten rid of this flag and then the Vs would be removed because it would not be able to use them anymore if I if I told it this this M uh, minus M AVX2 is a flag that's telling the compiler that it's possible to use that those additional instructions right um, minus M AVX or minus M AVX2 is saying use the AVX or AVX2 instruction set AVX2 FC would include AVX1 so that's saying like generate very modern code right. If, on the other hand, I got rid of that, it would not be able to use V prefix instructions anymore, which means it would totally have to change the way it was doing this instruction stream, right? Okay. Um, so you can pretty much see all of these are just raw math ops, and they're math ops with, if you remember what this routine was doing, you can see here I made it for you here, Raycast result. Uh, it's taking basically triangles that are batched eight at a time. So here is the triangle back structure. It's basically got an X, Y, U, X, U, Y, V, X, V, Y, Z, Z, U, V, right? These are all those pre, the, I've, I've pre-transformed everything into this triangle batch for testing. And it's exactly the same. It looks exactly the same as if it was one triangle. But actually, because these are M256s, each one of these things is eight values. So this is eight Xs, eight Ys, eight Uxs, eight Uis, eight Vxs, eight Vys, eight Zs, eight Zus, eight Zvs. Right? And so what we're doing in this loop is we're just doing eight triangles at a time. And so these subs are exactly that. They take... Uh, what we load up here, so we load up these things, these, these are the relative uh, x, y directions of the ray we're casting or whatever it is that we're doing, right? We load those up, and in here we, uh, actually that that's probably just the um, direction relative x, direction relative y. I don't remember exactly how those were encoded. You have to go back and watch the lecture, uh, but they're probably just like the point relative to something, you know, whatever it is, relative to the grid, who, who knows, right? Um, so anyway, doesn't matter. The point is, these are the values that the ray, uh, for the ray cast, this is saying where we're casting. Uh, and then what we're doing is trying to make it like, you know, here we've got an, you know, we're subtracting those two the, from the base values. We're trying to do is make it relative to the triangle, right? Then here we compute the U, V, and Z, just like I mentioned in the lecture, right? And that's just a bunch of multiply adds. And by the way, if uh, in the witness we weren't really using AVX, uh, so if you really wanted to fully AVX this routine up, I believe you can actually do an FMAD here, which does the multiply and the add in one step. So we could actually make this even better. Uh, it's, it's actually somewhat inefficient uh, the way it is now. Uh, you'd save a cycle uh, doing that. And it would be slightly more precise as well. Uh, then at the end, we do our comparisons, right? Uh, so we basically do a bunch of comps. And what comps do is they basically take two values, just, just like uh, you would have in you know, non-wide instructions, non-AVX instructions. They basically do comparisons between two values uh, in, in each lane, because you know you've got eight floating point values, right? When you do the comparison, what it does is it sticks all zeros or all ones into each of the 32-bit lanes, depending on the result of the comparison. So, like, if it was less than or equal to it, it'll put all ones in there. If it wasn't less than or equal to it, it'll put all zeros in there, right? So we basically do our comparisons this way, and we build up a little comp vector. That basically says for all eight things, we now have a mask that's like ones and zeros where they should be. And then we use the blend V, which basically is the thing that combines two values based on a third value, to keep all of the best results from this raycast. So we're raycast against eight. And I explained all this in the lecture, but just to refresh your memory, that's what's going on, right? And like I said, what you can see here is... Essentially, this stream just comes out almost exactly on this side, right? There's a couple of things that are slightly different, but the instruction stream is basically exactly the same. All of these are literally just the direct, a direct copy of what you see in here. Um, and we get down to this here, right? This LEA RDX. Uh, that's looking a little bit different, right? Like, what is that? Who knows, you know? Well, if you look you can see that each one of these math ops is operating off of the register RDX. What RDX has 
what they've done with RDX here is they've loaded the pointer to the triangle batch. So this pointer right here, that's the pointer of the triangle batch where we loaded out, right, all of our very all of the um, data for the triangle batch, that RDX value uh, is just the pointer. So each of these is loading out the values, like these values, each of these is just loading out the values, right, as they're needed as memory operands. So after they're all loaded out, this LEA RDX RDX plus 288, that instruction is just this plus plus pointer. Because remember, the pointer has to advance by the size of this structure. This structure here is 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9 times 32, right? Because each one of these, if, if 32, it takes 32 bytes to store eight floats, right? So each one of these MM256 is 256 bits. 32 bytes, right? So 9 times 32, that is where I get the 288. So this LEA is actually just an instruction that advances my pointer by 288. The reason it is called LEA is because, it, oh, wow. I didn't even know this did that. Look at that. Look at that. Oh, how, oh, wow. Look at that. This is great. This is great for beginners. It now shows you, if you hover over an instruction, what it does. Look at that. That's great work. Such a good utility. Such a good utility. Anyway, uh, the reason that it is called LEA is because that's short for Load Effective Address. Load effective address means it's going to give you something, uh, sorry, you're going to give it something on the right side of the assembly language instruction. And it's exactly like these memory operands, right? It's exactly like these memory operands. And what you're going to do with it is instead of using it as an operand, the thing that's at that address, just give me the address. Whatever the address is, put that actual result in here. So it's saying add 288 to RDX. Whatever the resulting address is, put that back in RDX, which has the effect of advancing RDX by 288 bytes. So it's going to do that. That's exactly what that piece of, of uh, code does there, right? It's then going to do all of this. So there's our comps, our ands, right? Our blends happen here, right? There's those two blends that combine the results. There's the add that advances them. And then we get to the end of the loop. And here is what happens at the end of the loop. Uh, what you can see here is there's this thing, add ESI1. ESI is just going to be the thing that's holding this count, right? Um, so it's decrementing the count by one. This doesn't have to be add ESI negative one. It could be sub ESI one. Uh, either way, just has to do a decrement. And then the JNE is the thing that says jump if not equal to zero, right? So in other words, if you haven't gotten to zero yet, you're going to jump back up. And if you look at where that is, it's right here. So we're going to jump back up to uh, zero three. Now, I'm not actually sure why it's done this weird shuffle here. You can see that there's stuff that doesn't really need to be done, but it did it anyway. Um, and I do not know why. So I might need a second here to figure out why. We don't care. It has nothing to do with what we're talking about now. But I'm just looking to see. See, th this part here. When we finish this loop, we're going to skip it. But if we don't enter the loop, I'm assuming we do it. Yeah. So we do that op if we hit here. So what is that op? It's moving into YMM0, which is the thing we're going to fill. So we're, that's what we put into best index. I'm not sure why it thinks it needs to do that. Um, I don't know why it did that. It decided, and this is pretty strange, but this is YMM0 here, right? 
it decided to insert a sp- I mean, what I would consider a spurious load. I mean, look at, you know, for those of you who know somebody out there, maybe you can catch what I'm missing. But on the entrance to the routine, right, uh, the the jump here, they just, it decided to jump around this mov of YMM0. It could have just moved this jump up above, I'm sorry, it could have just moved this this move up above the JE, and then it wouldn't have had to have this extra one here. So this, I haven't looked at it for very long, so I don't want to call, I don't want to cry foul, but that just looks like bad code gen to me. Uh, maybe there's something else going on there. Uh, I don't know, but weird. Anyway, we don't really care about that for purposes of what we're talking about, so we don't have to worry about it. All we're looking at is this. Uh, the reason all we're looking at is this is because this is the hot loop. This is the thing that's getting done for all the triangles, right? So it's doing them eight at a time. Each pass through this is doing eight triangle intersections for our raycaster. And we're just going to keep jumping back up to the beginning until we run out of triangles. That's what we're doing. So you can see it's very simple. Uh, there's not much to it. And so I guess now might be a good time for me to pause just briefly and make sure everyone understands what's going on here. And I'll try to take any questions that you have now before we switch over to looking at the scheduling uh, of of these operations, which is kind of the end because that was the that was the original question that prompted this. So we've walked all the way through it, and now we're just going to go through and see how they're scheduled. Okay, so now uh, we're going to get to the sort of the conclusion of the question that was asked, which is how is this stuff scheduled? So now we have an idea of what's going on in the chip. Remember that comes from here. Um, we know what our instruction stream is. So this is the stream that we're handing to the processor. It's reading in the bytes that encode this stuff here. Uh, and we know that what's happening is this part, this front end part, it's going out to this L1 instruction cache. It's saying, can you give me some instructions? Uh, at some point in the program, it's going to get to this part of the code. So these are the instructions that are going to come back. This is the memory that's going to come back, right? It's going to come through here at 16 bytes a cycle. Now, how many bytes per cycle is 16 bytes a cycle? Uh, I don't know if I can turn on uh, code bytes. Yes. Uh, these are the actual bytes. So you can see them there. That's what's being loaded. These are actual bytes, right? It's memory. That's what's going to get loaded. Um, they're usually turned off because they don't help you at all, right? They're just there for the machine to encode. But if you care, that's what they are. So those bytes are going to come in here at 16 bytes a cycle. They're going to go through uh, this process of turning them in to microops by decoding what the... Uh, what the instruction says to do. Those microops, which we don't know what they are yet because we haven't really talked about what this turns into in terms of microops, but those microops are going to flow through the system to the back end where they're going to get slots assigned to them in the register files using the register alias table or allocation table, whatever you want RAT to stand for. They're then going to flow through when they are ready to be scheduled and there are ports available for them to issue on. They're going to go into these execution units and they're going to execute. Uh, and we are then going to have actual work done on our behalf, right? So how do we start to look at how this works? Well, uh, the first thing is during the Q&A, uh, we kind of snuck a peek at this already. So uh, the cat is already out of the bag, but there is a fabulous uh, site called uops.info that if you program x64 processors, it's absolutely indispensable and fantastic, and I love it. And you can go to this part that's called table and click on open table. Uh, and then what you can do is you can enable whatever processor or instruction set and whatever that you want. So in this case, we're using, you know, like AVX and, you know, that kind of stuff, right? SSE. We're not using... FMA or AVX512 or any of these things at the moment. Uh, and then what we can do is we can look for any of these instructions. So if we want to know what microops happen with a V sub PS, this is how we tell. We put V sub PS inside the search box. We look at the 
a particular microarchitecture, and we could see multiple ones. So suppose we want also to know Zen 3. I can turn that on as well. So here's what happens on the AMD. Here's what happens on the Intel part, right? And we just read off for the instruction that we care about. Now, which instruction do we care about? These instructions are coded by what the operands are. XMM means an SSE register. So a four floating point wide, a 16 byte register, four floating point wide. If you see YMM, YMM is the is the twice as large registers. That's the eight wide floating point registers or 32 bytes. Similarly, M128, which stands for 128 bits, which is 16 bytes, is a 16 byte, a you know, it's a four float wide piece of memory. So this is if there was a memory operand and the memory operand is 16 bytes. M256, same thing. It's when you have a memory operand that's 32 bytes. So when we look back here at our compiler explorer and we see a V sub PS, we see two YMM registers and a YMM, right? A YMM memory operand. We know that we are looking at this instruction, V sub PS, YMM, YMM, M256. That means we can just read straight across at the port listing and see what it does. Now, what you can see here is that because the Zen 3 stomps on Intel's face 24 hours a day, um, and, uh, you know, Lisa Sue curses her life that this happened during the chip supply shortage, otherwise her company would now basically supply the entire world with x64s, and Intel would just be some company begging for change on the side of the highway. But... The Zen 3 only needs one micro-op to do this instruction. I believe that's because, uh, and I don't have any experience with Zen 3. I don't even have one. I uh, wish I did. They sound awesome. Um, my understanding is Zen 3 has some pretty advanced stuff for memory operands. Uh, there's some weird stuff that it does where it has like a whole thing for, it, it'll even like, if you refer to the same memory operand multiple times, it'll basically treat it like a register, only that you didn't have to name so you don't pay the extra cost for, like, recomputing the address or whatever. Like, there is crazy stuff it sounded like in the Zen 3. It sounded awesome. So I don't know. So I can't comment on this side, but the point is you read it the exact same way. So much like I said over here, we read across. We say, okay, on the Skylake, which is what we care about, what's it going to do? It's going to issue one micro-op on port 0 or 1. Either port will do it. And one micro-op on port 2 or port 3. Now, mind you, these are not in order. It's not saying that it will issue on port 01 first and then on port 2 or 3 second. In fact, I think it's the other way around because ports 2 and 3 are the address generation units. So they are the ones who are handling the memory operand, which you have to get before you can do the add, which happens on port 01. So it probably happens in the other way around. But the point is, this tells you what micro ops are actually generated. We know it will take two micro ops to complete this instruction. On the AMD, it sounds like it's only one micro-op. It's just one micro-op on the floating point side, uh, which is the one that handles like vector instructions, and it can be on ports two or three, supposedly. That's what it says. Don't know. Don't have a Zen 3. Couldn't tell you. Anyway. I, don't know, I need to make more friends at AMD so that they'll send me a Zen 3 machine. But back in the day, let me just tell you, Back in the day, we had it so good. In the old days, uh, people who optimized code actually got machines for free from hardware vendors. So we got all our graphics cards for free in the mail from NVIDIA. We got processors for free in the mail, like machines, whole machines, from AMD and Intel. Nowadays, ain't nobody send me nothing. You know what I'm saying? No, nobody cares about me. It's fine. They shouldn't. There's no point to it. But I'm just saying, you know, it used to be halcyon days. You know, getting a whole machine for free in the mail. I mean, come on. What more do you want in life, really? If you can't be happy when people are sending you graphics cards and machines in the mail, then when can you be happy is what I would say. I mean, that's the life, man. That's the life. So anyway... 
Couldn't tell you about Zen 3. My point is I just wanted to show you that if you turned that on, you could see it. Uh, and that's true of any microarchitecture that uops.info supports, which is a lot of microarchitectures. So for example, you could also look at Ice Lake, which is a more modern Intel architecture. It's what's in like laptops now that they ship. Uh, and you can see the difference between them. So in this case, you know, looking across, there isn't, I don't see much. So it looks like they haven't changed that one very much. And that's because Ice Lake is very similar. Uh, there's not a lot of changes between Skylake and But Ice Lake does have slightly different execution ports. So on other instructions, there would be a difference. Uh, it, it added some, some extras. Right? So uh, if you take a look, we now know uh, if we were to just look at our compiler stuff, we're like, oh, okay, so each one of these, and you know, uh, it, it is actually true of anything that does a memory operand. It generally is one microop for the memory operand and one microop for the uh, actual floating point operation. Now, a microop is not a cycle. It just means what's flowing through the pipeline. So, you know, two microops, you know, two, 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 oh, sorry, one, one, because this one doesn't have memory operand. Two, 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 one. Uh, well, I assume that's one. I don't remember. I think we looked and it was one. Uh, during the Q&A. Uh, one, 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 right? So it's pretty easy. We can just look and basically you're just going to have, if there's, a, if there's a memory operand, it's an extra micro op. Otherwise, if it's a basic math op, it's probably one micro op for the math op, right? So a bunch of twos, some ones, twos, ones. And then we get here, and now we have um, a certain... Uh, sauciness. Now, let me mention one thing. There's a thing called microop fusion. And because this is, I mean, presumably people ask me to go through this because they want to know all these crazy details. This thing called microop fu fusion. And what microop fusion is on Intel hardware is the fact that certain microops don't count against your penalty. Right, like so. When you look at this thing, you know what I'm saying. Um, and you look at how these UOPs are flowing through the pipeline. When two microops are fused, I believe they count as one through the pipe. So when you see something here like four UOPs or five UOPs or six UOPs as like a restriction, I meaning you can't get more than that, or like here where it says four UOP going to the registry alias table. For certain purposes, and far be it for me to say what they all are because I don't study Intel architectures nearly enough to know, when two microops are marked for microop fusion, it means they will flow through the path as if they were one microop. They're like bundled together. Memory ops usually are that way. So when these two operations are issued, they're often issued as a pair that doesn't count against your penalty, like, like against your uh, total, right? So normally, if these two microops were completely separate, right, you would have to pay for them. But in this case, maybe they're fused together. Now, hopefully, we'll see that uh, come, come, come up a little bit more in here. Um, you can see here there's like macro fused. That's a different thing. Uh, I don't know if the microop fusion is mentioned, but it, it's kind of implicit here, right? Um, there's an issued and an exec, and we'll go through what these are, but you can kind of see here, it's like it issued one, but it executed two. Um, and I believe that's I believe that's how this tool tries to tell you that microop fusion took place. Anyway, it doesn't matter much. You don't have to understand that for a lot of things. Uh, but it's just when you're starting to talk about micro ops and how many of them you can do every cycle because there's these limits four five six etc micro op fusion is a way to get around those limitations because you can get you can snuggle in some work that wouldn't have been true if they weren't fused and you know this is why bringing it back to earlier when i got uh kind of worried when we looked at this compiler over here i may have said oh you can add another compiler right when we looked at the other compiler, I saw this. And what you can see happening here is it's doing a load to load the uh, contents into these registers first. 
and then it's doing the operations on them. So instead of using a memory operand, it's actually got an instruction. That worries me because you saw me get worried about it before. Why did it worry me? Well, there's two reasons. One, each one of these instructions now counts against my decode total. So when I look back here and you see there's these decoders, well, there's only four simple decoders in here that these are going to go through. So I can only decode four instructions per cycle. Well, each one of these counts as an instruction. So here we started doing subtracts right away. Whereas here we spent one entire cycle doing nothing <coughs> other than decoding these instructions, right? So that's a bottleneck right there. Now there's reasons why there, it, it's going to be even slower than that because these are memory operands, but we're going to ignore that for now. I'm just talking about the instruction part. So generating extra instructions for no reason is usually very bad because it starts to put pressure on the front end that didn't need to be there. And then there's the microop problem. Each one of these generates one microop at least, right? Um, a vmove APS, if I look it up, is going to generate a microop, right? Uh, now, in this case, uh, what have I got? I've got a YMM register and a YMM memory address. So I look in here and I say, okay, uh, it's, it's this guy right here. It's one microop on port two or three. Well, the problem now is that that's a microop that's free floating. It's not fused. That means the sub PS, right, that you would have done uh, here and here, right? Before, we were doing those as one thing. So those operands were, uh, sorry, that's wrong. Here and here. So before, they were fused microops and will pass through as one microop. Now they're two separate microops, which again doubles the size of this thing as it passes through this system, each of which has a cycle, a, a count per cycle limit. Every cycle, it can only send four down this path, five down that path, six down this path, right? Four down that path. So if you're just being bloated and you're sending all of these extra micro-ops that could have been fused, but you didn't, you're putting a bunch of pressure on the front end that may mean that you will get less performance because even though the back end could have done the work that you asked for, it didn't get there in time, right? So you can see why now that we know a little bit more, that we've covered a little bit more, why I got so nervous when I saw this because I was like, that doesn't really make any sense. While it might be fine for this code because it might bottleneck on port two and three anyway, because it's got too many memory operands here, so it wouldn't matter because it'll stall no matter how you phrase it, it will stall on the loads uh, or something, right? Just because it might not matter when I look at the whole thing, I don't like to write code sloppy just because it might not matter. I'd rather just take that out of my brain and not have to worry about it, right? So I got worried about that. It's possible that the compiler knows something here that I don't know. Again, I'm not the uh, I'm not the world champion optimizer. Uh, I'm not even the world champion optimizer's assistant, and so I'm not prepared to say this is bad code gen. It's just something that made me nervous when I was like, I don't know why it's doing that. This one makes me a lot more comfortable. It looks like what I would have expected. So, for what it's worth. Um. Now, we've got microops throughout here that are pretty straightforward. So we know all these are microops. They'll travel fused. Uh, we know we generate one microops for these other ones. And then we get to the end here, and this is the last thing I want to talk about before we look at the exact schedule. These are generating microops in a much more confusing way. These are doing what's called macroop fusion. And macroop fusion happens when you have an instruction that the front end will simply handle for you, basically. So although, the, although these look like two instructions, an add and a JNE, what they will actually reduce to is just one instruction, effectively, called an add JNE, right? It's basically like an add plus a JNE together. So you actually get them sort of for free through the entire thing. Like, it's just going to look at that as one instruction and 
the entire time it'll just be one uop which is the ad that flows through um so it's like the best possible case so hopefully that all makes some sense now let's look at the schedule how is this going to be scheduled the easiest way to do this is just mentally uh, you can just think about how it's going to get scheduled. So you're like, okay, the subs happen, the moles happen. I know which ports they happen on, and I can think it through. You can usually just do this with a little you know, pencil. It's not that hard. But if you want to start getting more hardcore about it, uh, that uups.info site uh, that I talked about also has a thing on it uh, that you can click on called UICA. And UICA is a little tool you can see I've already set it up for us here, but all I did is just cut and paste this. You can literally just cut and paste the code that comes out um, of the compiler here. And I place it into the loop, right? And you just surround it with like the loop part here. It doesn't really matter about that part, but you just put it inside the loop part. And then you can check off which architectures you want. Sadly, they don't have Zen. Maybe someday they will, but right now they only have Intel architectures. You put in the instructions that you want to analyze. You click on the run button. Uh, and you get a complete analysis of how the port breakdown will go for your program. Right? So if you want to see how things are scheduled, this is a really easy way to get a basic picture of what the processor is actually going to do. Now, as you can see, it's a little confusing, so we're going to go through it in a little bit more detail to understand what's going on. But before I do that, I'm also going to point out some other things. If you click on some of the additional options here, so I put graph, for example, and hit run, uh, it adds this little open graph button. When you open the graph, you can see a series of lines that show you what they expect the issuance to be for various things. So UOPS on port zero, right, or whatever, right? So you can kind of see this is an, what it's saying here is, let's suppose we just ran this loop forever. On each cycle, here's how, by, by the time we got to cycle 300, we would have expected to, you know, issue uh, like 924 micro ops. Right? Um, so that's kind of fun. Uh, and similarly, you can put in trace table and hit run. And trace table gives you, I, I think, I don't know. It gives you, I think, what the original asker, Buddy's Pizza, <laughs> the original Twitch ask, uh, or, or person who asked on Twitter, I should say, uh, whose handle on Twitch is Buddy's Pizza. I think this is what maybe they were kind of wondering about. This graph shows you what the processor is going to do as far as we know. As far as we know. It's going to take this V sub. It's going to go into the dispatch queue. It's going to issue it. It's going to take some time to do stuff. It's going to dispatch it. It's going to take some time to do stuff. It's going to be done, which is the E. Uh, wait. No, sorry. It's going to be one, two, three. Yeah, yeah. It's going to be dispatched. It's going to, so that's going to actually do it. It's going to be executed, and then it's going to be retired, right? And... This is literally showing how as the processor, right now the processor is in like a cold state. So all the ports are open and all the queues are empty. As we start filling things in, right, you can see us get to the point where we loop back around. By the time we're looping back around, the same instruction, which is this instruction that was up here, right, you can see it's the exact same place. We jumped and we're back, is now going to take much longer right? The reason it's going to take much longer is because the processor is full of crap that it's still doing from the previous iteration of the loop. 
So the way that these tools work is they try to figure out how long they have to run this thing before they get to their like natural width, right? And at some point that natural width is hit. And when that natural width is hit, you know basically the run speed of the algorithm were it to be run in the processor for a while, right? And it's like something like this. You can see it's like not really getting wider anymore. You know what I'm saying? Uh, and so if you were to look, and, and this is not, you know, again, this is like the 15th iteration of the loop. If you were to look at the difference between when you started the first uh, instruction on the 15th iteration of the loop and when you f uh, started the last one, the number of cycles, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, maybe, right? The number of cycles between the start of that uh, loop and the end of it uh, is what you expect your cycle time to be for the loop. That's how long it takes to get to the next, to, to start issuing the next instruction. Uh, and if you look here, it gives you that number, uh, 10, right? I mean, 9.3, <laughs> who knows? It depends because it's not always even, right? Like sometimes the port will be free on every other cycle or whatever, right? On every other iteration or something like that. So this value, predicted throughput, is the number of cycles that it expects you to take to run one iteration of this loop assuming that you are running lots of iterations of this loop so that it's had time to fill the whole pipeline with work. So the latency of this loop may have nothing to do with 9.38, meaning the time between when you start the loop and when you end the loop may have nothing to do with this. But when sustained, when looped, just run over and over and over again, assuming you're not stalled, like assuming that everything's hot in a cache that's fast enough and whatever, the actual execution of the instructions should take about 9.38 cycles, so let's say 10 cycles, from start to finish um, before it gets back up to the previous, to, before it jumps back to the top of the loop and starts again. Now, it hasn't finished, it hasn't retired all those instructions, it just issued them all. And then it goes back and issues some more, right? So by using this number, roughly... You can multiply by how many iterations of the loop you expect to do and roughly estimate what your cycle count will be for doing the batch. So if you're running a thousand batches through it, you would multiply this number by a thousand. That's how many cycles you would expect it to run in optimal circumstances. Right? So that's the idea. Now, how do we read this thing? Well, what this thing says is, let's pretend, like I said before, that we're just running this loop over and over and over and over again, back to back. So we start at the V sub PS, the very first thing in the loop. We issue all these instructions. We jump back to the beginning of the loop, and we issue them all again. And we go, and we go, and we go, and we go. This table tells us, if we were to imagine running this for a very long time, and we looked to see in our little, because remember, this is, this is simulating the processor. It's not exact. It's just someone's model of the processor that tries to model all of the steps that the Skylake architecture goes through, or some other architecture if you picked a different architecture up here. It's trying to model all of those stages and simulate what the chip will do. What it does is it, on each iteration through the loop in this simulation, it tries to do the actual scheduling that it imagines that the chip is probably doing. And when it figures out which port it will actually put something on, it writes down the fact that it did that. Then at the very end, it says, okay, for n for this many iterations of the loop, let's say I simulated it a thousand loops, right? I take the percentage of the time that I scheduled it on each port, and I report that percentage here. So this means that this was scheduled like 44% of the time on port 0 and 56% of the time on port 1, right? And that's the subtract part because that's on port 0 and 1. Port 2 and 3, right, are the memory part, and that was happening 48% of the time on port 2 and 52% of the time on port 3, right? 
So this tells you what percentage of the time a port was used by a particular instruction. The reason that this is useful is because it can help tell you when you end up bottlenecking behind some port. In this particular program, uh, this is pretty well parallelizable by the processor. It's got a bunch of mulls and adds and stuff to do, so it's a little bit starved on port 0 and 1, right? It's not really going to be able to issue uh, four uh, instructions per cycle because the uh, the subs, the mulls, the adds, like all of these floating point operations, the comps, those have to happen all on basically the same port, right? So because you have all of these instructions, basically this entire block, not this one here, but everything else down to here, all has to happen on port 01. It means that this whole first part is all going to have to basically issue only two instructions per cycle because first port 1 will get used then port uh, for first port 0 will get used then port 1 will get used and then it can't issue any more instructions so even for these instructions here that are not dependent on each other right even for ones that are not dependent on each other it can't issue more of them because it doesn't have the work units to do so if we go back and think about the maximum throughput we could get is roughly four instructions per cycle on a skylake. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, seventeen, eighteen, nineteen, twenty, twenty-one, twenty-two, twenty-three, twenty-four, twenty-five. We don't count this one because it's fused. Twenty-five instructions divided by four would be six or something cycles, right? Six point something. And we are nine point something. Why? Because exactly that. We won't have enough resources to actually execute these instructions. So even if we didn't have some interior dependency change, which I don't think we have enough interior dependency change to matter. So, because remember, you can't in execute an instruction if the previous instruction uh, it, somewhere up in the chain hasn't completed yet and you need its result. That's a problem too, right? Um, but because in this circumstance our loop is not dependent, the next iteration of our loop is completely independent of the previous, They're, right? Like they basically can do entirely in parallel, and they only have to actually synchronize up at just this one point here, right? You know what I'm saying? Um, so, so basically, well, it's not quite true right there, right? So the whole first part of this loop can overlap from iteration to iteration just fine. So it can extract, it could keep extracting more parallelism out of this probably. But the bottom line is there just aren't enough of these ports. So I would assume, and I don't know because I don't have one, but if, and this doesn't support Zen, but if we were to look at like a Zen 3, I would expect it to crush this probably because it can issue four, I believe, of some of these. It has four ports that can do things like sub PS, I believe. Don't quote me on that, but I think that's true. Um, so the more execution ports you have, the more parallelism you can extract here, and I think it would be able to do better. So it would probably be able to push this more down towards the six. Uh, and plus, it actually can decode six instructions at once, so... I think could also possibly might even go higher than that. You don't even know. So yeah, microarchitecture makes a difference, huge difference, but you can see what's going on here, right? That's the end of the two part series. I hope that gave enough detail into how the assembly language stuff works to the extent that software people like me know how it works. Because again, like I said, 
uh, unless you're a hardware person and you really work on these chips day to day, your knowledge of exactly what goes on inside the CPU is necessarily limited. Not only do you not necessarily have all the time you would need to really understand how those chips work, uh, but also you don't necessarily even have the details, right? Because again, they're proprietary chips from propri proprietary manufacturers, and they don't release things like detailed schematics of exactly what's going to go on inside the chip. So we only have a high level view of it. And fortunately, that's usually all we need when we're trying to optimize things, because unless you really want to get every last little cycle out of it, you typically just need to know the basic idea of how things are flowing through. And sometimes the little tiny details do matter. And in those cases, you're usually left either doing a tremendous amount of research on your own in experimentation or working with someone at Intel or AMD to help you because they have simulators uh, that will simulate their chips and show exactly what they do. So they can know, but without working with them, it, it may be very difficult for you to be able to figure it out if it's something really uh, specific. So that's it for this series. I hope you enjoyed it. Uh, I'm going to post a additional part to this, which is not actually part of the technical aspects of it. That's just uh, folks asked about our Meow the Infinite book series as part of it, because since this was all part of a Kickstarter uh, campaign for it, um, people had questions. And some of the questions were fun, and some of the answers I thought were fun. So I'm also going to put up a video after this one that just kind of has a collection of those questions for folks who are interested in it, and especially for people who've already backed the Kickstarter, um, just to thank them for their support and to have you know some of those questions available for people who didn't catch the live streams, because live streams you know are, are sometimes very difficult for people to catch if you even know that they're happening. So thanks everyone for watching, and I'll be back here with that uh, in the next video.